The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily represent those of Access Fort Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting group. Get involved with Access Fort Wayne and make your own television programming. Call 421-1250 to find out more.
speed, Wesley. Okay, we are out here at the emergency event that I am with. Richard Romick with R Romick Fire and Rescue. Okay, and can you tell us what you got today? Sure, we have a segmented uh, fire truck train ride uh, that my dad and I uh, uh, got and put together and painted up and uh, uh, we've been putting smiles on faces for uh, about three years with this and travel all over Ohio and parts of Indiana and uh, just about wherever people want us to go. Awesome, and we saw your little display thing you made too? Sure, so uh, over on our table uh, I have a 124th scale fire station diorama that I built and inside the firehouse I have four uh, late 1950s, early 1960s American LaFrance fire trucks, uh, along with a 1959 Cadillac ambulance. Um, in front of the fire station uh, this past week, I, I cast out of resin um, 686 boots, um, which is 343 pairs for the 23 chiefs, the 22 lieutenants, uh, the 46 captains and the 252 firemen that did not come back from the towers on 9-11. Along with those boots, I also cast two more pairs for the two EMTs that didn't make it back. And I'm, I'm very proud to have it and very, very thankful to bring it uh, over with us today. And it's, it's just kind of cool to look at. And how we get hold of you in case you, they want you to come out? So uh, we've got some flyers on, on another table that has all of our contact information. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook um, at uh, Facebook at uh, Romick Railway um, and also uh, my dad's phone number uh, which would happen to be 419-421-7262 and we do birthday parties, church events, town festivals, family reunions, uh, parades, uh, just about anything. Awesome, ain't gonna ask Tosa? I don't have anything, Wes. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Wesley. Okay, we are out here at the emergency fit in New Haven. I am with Robert Summers. And can you tell us what you do in the back of the truck we saw? Um, I chase the front tractor. I am the tiller man in the back. Yeah, we saw. Um, so where are you guys from? Uh, we have uh, our trucks in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Awesome. And can you? Uh, you know how old this plot is? This is our 56 tractor drawn aerial Seagrave. Uh, this is our 57 over here as well, if you guys get a picture of that. And then we have uh, a 29 that we have at home and another 57 sister truck to that. Oh, so awesome. So we're, we're collectors. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome, Leslie. Nice to meet you, man. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you. I, I have a question. Sure. Quick, yeah. If you don't mind. Um, you're obviously driving the back of the truck. Yeah. Um, you don't really see that anymore. Like, what what changed? Did something happened like that? You don't see the people uh, driving the back of the truck. Anymore. Uh, larger cities typically run them with tighter corners. You know, tall buildings. When you need a big ladder truck and you don't have the area where a full length track, you know, well, fire truck, you need a tractor and, and ladder so you can swing the corners or whatever you guys got, whatever they got to do. So they I, still got them. Well, they still make them. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. I know. Uh, Plenty of Florida towns. I think New York still has at least five of them. <laughs> oh, wow. So, okay. yeah, they're not as common because... Did it, did it take, like, you, did it take, like, like, any special training or anything to do that? Um, How do you exactly line up with the driver of the truck? Uh, look forward. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> Pointer forward, and you can't really go anywhere. You know, it's either left or right, or you're going straight. You just figure out where straight is. We actually put a mark on the steering wheel, so... that It's fairly intuitive once you get into it but I've, I've only I only do historic trucks never been a firefighter or anything I'm okay. I'm the resident mechanic so and uh, lady was saying that you guys are from like the Grand Rapids Michigan area yeah Grand Rapids okay cool. absolutely Leslie do you have any more questions I don't us? think so I think that's it awesome thank you for more thanks guys thank you Robert no can problem can you write your name down for us oh yeah absolutely and I was like, okay we are back out here at the emergency event, and I am with Chad Radke. And can you tell us about what you bought out here today? This is a it's a 2016 17 build of a uh, by Mild Wild Jim Gers, the guy in uh, Michigan built the uh, chassis for me, and then I did all the finish work on it. 
it's called a rock bouncer. I spent a lot of years in the fire service, so I had to do a fire theme. And uh, so it had to have lights and sirens on it. So it's, uh, it's a 383 stroker. It's about 500 horse on the crank. Um, it's basically designed to race up the side of a mountain. It's, uh, it's a rock crawler on steroids, you could say. And where are you from? Uh, out by Columbia City. Oh, awesome. So not too far away. Anything else, Tulsa? Uh, talk to us a little bit about how this is involved with like public rescue and that sort of thing. It's not. It's a personal play toy. It's oh. all it is. <laughs> it's, it's designed. It's not street legal. It's designed for total off-road. Um, like I said, it's designed basically for fun and racing up the side of mountains. Um, but I just I spent a lot of years in the fire service, so I wanted the the fire theme, and that's hence the name. The rig's name is Forcible Entry because that's what we do, what you do in the uh, fire service. You have to break into stuff to get into. Um, locked doors and so on and so forth is right. a forcible entry is a procedure so keeping in that we're forcing our way up the side of a mountain I just kind of thought that would fit kind of well with the uh, the name and the theme I think that's it oh, I got I got another yeah, question no. if you don't mind no uh, what um, talk to us a little bit about the places you've been with this view uh, it's been to Attica which is the Badlands it's been up to Bundy Hill um, and really, that's the only places I've taken it so far. Hopefully, uh, in the spring of next year, we're going to take a trip down to Tennessee for a week or so and, and have some good times down there. Cool. I noticed the quote from Benjamin Franklin on yes. the dock. Can you talk on that a little bit? Uh, ben Franklin, it says, the, is our founding father. And uh, anybody that knows the fire service is one of the first things you learn in it when you're going through your trainings, or at least you used to when, my, when I started, is Ben Franklin was the father of the fire service. He was the founding father started the very first fire department in the United States out on the East Coast. So, him being the founding father. So, our founding father. And then it's got his birth date and, his, and, his, and his, the date he passed. And then it's the Brotherhood, which is the fire service. Great. Anything else, Wes? I don't think so. Speed. Okay, we are back out here at the New Haven Fire... I don't know why I want to call it Fire Marshal today. The emergency event in here in New Haven, I am with... Gene Landers, Orange Township Fire Department. And what do you guys have to offer today? Uh, you, we're, we're doing a raffle. 50% uh, of the proceeds are going to the Shanksville Fire Department. Uh, today we're raffling off uh, a TL2 Phoenix uh, leather helmet, um, a chance to win a, either extrication gloves or firefighting gloves, and the opportunity for a Get Hosed Apparel custom radio strap. Oh, wow. And where are you guys from, like West City? State? We're, we're from Rome City, Indiana. And uh, we're helping uh, Shanksville, Pennsylvania Fire Department, who is uh, basically the home of the uh, Flight 93 crash, uh, if anybody can remember that. Yeah, they are talking about that this morning. Good deal. Thank you. You bet. You got any questions, Tulsa? No, good job. Thank you. Stay tuned for more.
continue to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic, safety is a top priority for our patients, visitors, and staff. We are doing everything we can to ensure that our facilities and the dedicated men and women who deliver the care within the walls continue to function at an optimal level while minimizing the risk of transmitting the virus. To demonstrate the safety measures in place across the Parkview Health System, we've invited team members from each of our community hospitals to share a behind the scenes glimpse at just some of the preventative practices in place. I watched a video that Dr. Myers sent us of an anesthesiologist hand washing. Mm -hmm. And after he kind of washed his hand and grabbed a squirt in the break room by the bathrooms, there's hand sanitizing stations readily available. PPE is personal protective equipment. The personal protective equipment also helps protect me as well as the patient from the spread of germs and viruses. Gowns help protect us from any blood exposure, any, anyone who's coughing or sneezing, any body fluids. We have gloves, so any touch contact that helps with reducing any contamination that way. The masks help prevent us from inhaling any particles. Also, if we exhale any particles, it helps protect the patient and then my goggles protect my eyes and the mucous membranes. So if we have a patient come into the ER in respiratory distress, we'll take them immediately back to a negative airflow room. Um, we have this special part that we can use if we need to do any type of intubation. That is a high risk procedure. So for that, we will only have the primary RN, the doctor and the respiratory therapist in the room. That's gonna decrease exposure for the rest of the staff. We will also have another staff member outside the room to grab other supplies that we might need. So some of the changes that we've been able to make is we've been able to create more negative airflow pressure rooms. We originally only had two and now we have 10, which is awesome. So I know that word kind of sounds scary. What is negative airflow? Negative airflow just means that we are not going to be recycling the air throughout the hospital and that this room will have its own fresh air every minute. And that way we can protect you guys and ourselves from everyone else as we're walking in and out of here. At Parkview Noble Emergency Room, we continue being safe so we can provide our patients with safe, excellent care. We do that by wearing a PAPR when we are taking care of patients who have COVID symptoms. And when we don't wear PAPRs, we're wearing our N95s and our goggles to keep everyone safe. We are asking everyone to wear a mask while they are here at the hospital. This includes patients, visitors, nurses, doctors, and the rest of the staff. When we all wear masks, it will help protect each other from the risk of being exposed to COVID-19. As an EVS team member, I can tell you cleaning and disinfecting is the first line of defense in protecting patients and co-workers. Parkview has an enhanced cleaning measures for the safety of everyone who is treated in or works in the emergency department here at Parkview Huntington. Getting patients better safely is our priority. At our emergency department, we have instituted safety precautions for your visit, including social distancing, helpful signage, and restricted visitation. Please do not delay your care. We have dedicated and skilled coworkers and physicians here ready to assist you in your time and need. I do try to approach every patient the same way. Um, as if they were a family member of mine and I try to uh, do my best um, to take their goals in mind and what they're trying to accomplish with their health and what I'm trying to accomplish and trying to find an appropriate compromise to that. I do believe that people's health is a negotiation and it's a relationship so um, that can be difficult at first sometimes we don't see eye to eye right when you come in uh, but uh, we, I always try to work to meet the patient where they are I am very risk averse when it comes to patient care. I'm not going to place you in harm's way if I'm not certain that that's what needs to be done. I'm not going to tell you to take something if I don't know for certain that it's going to help you. I also often trim med lists when people come to see me because they're on way too much stuff and they're not getting better. Helping patients avoid disease or uh, avoid worsening of their current disease is something that we spend a considerable amount of time on. You need to focus your attention on your health with doing as much as you can to eliminate preventable diseases and unnecessary suffering that you can. Treat it as an asset that you have. It's your most valuable asset. It can't be bought. 
you need to hold on to it for as long as you can. Happy holidays from all of us at Parkview Health. On the first day of Christmas, my Parkview gave to me a hospital in my community. On the second day of Christmas, my Parkview gave to me two acts of love and a hospital in my community. On the third day of Christmas, my Parkview gave to me three true friends, two acts of love and a hospital in my community. I'm Selena. I'm a registered nurse at Parkview Hospital Randalia in the emergency department and today we're going to talk to you about what to do if someone has a seizure in public. Anyone can have a seizure. There are a multitude of reasons why someone could have a seizure. One of the reasons could be a low blood sugar, a high fever in an infant, a massive stroke, or a chronic condition called epilepsy. So things to do when someone has a seizure. The first thing you're gonna do is protect the person's safety because they're unaware of their surroundings and they're not able to control any of their movements. You do not wanna restrain the person while they're having a seizure. This could do more harm than good to yourself and also the person that's having the seizure. Step two, you wanna turn the person to a sideline position because the tongue can obstruct the airway and so when we turn someone to the side, they're able to have their tongue off to the side of their mouth. It will also allow saliva to run down their face and not into their lungs. Step three, unlike the myths you may have heard, you do not want to put anything into the person's mouth because it could do more harm than good. 
Step four, you want to remove any restrictive items such as glasses or tight clothing around the neck so that way the person's able to breathe appropriately. Step five, you want to time the seizure. This is really important. Seizures will typically last between one to three minutes on their own. If seizures last five minutes or longer, then it's likely that they won't stop until interventions have been given by a medical provider. Step six, you wanna stay calm in this situation because seizures can look really scary and you wanna reassure the person and the family members around. You wanna stay with the person because this person is gonna go through a post-ictal stage. They're gonna feel tired, they're gonna be confused, they may just wanna sleep, and this can last minutes up to a couple hours. This person will not remember the event that just happened, and they may also complain of a headache and sore muscles. Just remember, when you see someone having a seizure in public, you are in a supportive role, and you wanna stay with them and call 911 until help arrives. I think it's really important that you all know that A, we're open for business in the emergency department. We're ready to go. We've got our trauma team ready to go. We have our cardiology team ready to go. We have our stroke team ready to go. So anything you need from an emergency standpoint, we're ready to go. I also want to give you some assurance that we're taking every measure we can to keep everyone safe. We screen all of our patients today as they walk into the emergency department. We give them a mask if they need to have a mask on, and that's been very helpful. And then we try to get them back to a room as quickly as possible. We have areas of the ED that are set up for COVID type patients, and we have areas of the ED that are set up for non-COVID type patients. So we don't mix the two people. Sometimes it's really hard to tell up front. So we also have another area that's really kind of a warm area, we call it. And that's where we put people that may or may not have COVID symptoms, but predominantly don't have COVID symptoms. So we see a lot of people that come in with shortness of breath, and maybe that shortness of breath is from heart failure, or maybe that shortness of breath is from COVID. So we try to sort that out as quickly as possible. We have seen some people that over the past several weeks that have delayed coming to the emergency department. And what I wanna assure you today is that if you feel like you may be having a heart attack or you feel like you're having stroke-like symptoms, numbness in your arms or legs, weakness in your arm or leg, inability to speak or other problems like that, you need to come to the emergency department right away. If you delay that care for a couple of days or three to four days, as we've seen with some people, then that really takes you out of the window of opportunity to, for us to intervene to improve those symptoms or reverse the causes of your stroke. The same thing with chest pain. If you're having a lot of chest pain, then you need to come to the emergency department right away. We can intervene quickly. We can take you to the cath lab if we need to. We can give you medications that can make your heart attack less severe and before that permanent damage is done to your heart. And the same thing with the stroke. Before that permanent damage is done to the brain, there are certain people that we can intervene on. You don't have to be concerned about catching COVID from coming to the emergency department because of all the precautions that we've taken. We also have a really good sterilization technique that we use now with ultraviolet lights and other cleaning materials that when we have a patient that has COVID or suspected of COVID in a room, we clean that room for three hours after they've been in that room and make sure that that room's 100% safe for the next person that comes in that room. Also, we've made every single one of our rooms a single room, so there's no shared patient rooms at all. And we wanna make sure that you're the only one in that room so that you're gonna be safe. If you have symptoms like shortness of breath, they may or may not be COVID and you feel like you're having quite a bit of, of significant shortness of breath, then I would encourage you to come to the emergency department for an evaluation. If you have COVID, then we can manage that appropriately. If you feel like you have just a little bit of a dry cough and you're not feeling well, and you have a fever maybe, maybe not, it's okay to stay home. Parkview has some walk-in clinics that are still open, and we also have the respiratory clinics, and the respiratory clinics are really geared more for people that have cough, congestion, runny nose, things that may be COVID or may not be COVID. We can do testing there for COVID and we can do testing in the hospital for COVID also. One of the um, limitations that we do have now because of COVID is that we have a visitor restriction policy. So if you bring your family member to the emergency department, you won't be able to come into the emergency department. That's both for your safety and for the safety of everyone else and also to preserve our, our uh, protective equipment so that we don't have to use that if, we don't ne if it's not necessary. But if you bring someone to the emergency department, we will take your name and your number and we write it on a special piece of paper so that we can contact you you're more than welcome to call back at any time to check on your loved one, but we also will give you a call to let you know what the findings are, how things are going, and what the plan of care will be. 
it is important for you to let whoever picks you up or brings you to the hospital. If you do have chest pain and you call 911, but you also have a fever or some other symptoms that you're worried about COVID, that you share that with your with the EMS people because everyone around you needs to know that you may or may not have COVID. And if you don't have any fever or you don't have any respiratory symptoms, but maybe you just have severe chest pain, then let us know and we'll still take the appropriate precautions at that time. We absolutely are open 24 seven. We will be able to take care of any emergency today, just like we could in February or January or last summer. So come on in and we'll be able to manage that just appropriately. Today was a chance to see what mass casualty really looks like and what the folks in Vegas have seen, what the folks in Boston have seen, just a mass influx of people in a short amount of time. And the biggest thing for the hospital is how do we keep our resources up to speed? How do we keep our staffing where it needs to be? How do we track everything that's going on? And it's an incredible challenge to do that, but the team really rose to the occasion today. We do at least two drills a year, but not in my memory have we done anything of this magnitude. We've, we, th we threw put 103 patients today in about 35 minutes. That's just unheard of. They don't know the type of scenario. So the, the scenario today is 100 patients and it's gunshot wounds. There were patients injured from chaos and being trampled. We didn't want to use paper cards or mannequins. We wanted to use real people with makeup. So that took a lot of people and a lot of planning to do that. And then also the planning involved having every department ready, which included every department having their own plan. And so over the last year, we've done 50 plans for the hospital. So it's, a, it's been a lot of planning, but really the last six, six months was getting down into the details. Well, almost every day we sometimes have, you know, over capacity issues, multiple patients. Last week we had 11 patients come within an hour and so it's really a small drill every day here, but when it, it's something large happens in the community, it's gonna really test our resources. The big test today is gonna to be the, the bringing in the mass casualty patients in succession with multiple numbers of patients coming at the same time and sorting those patients out to see that they get the right care in the right place at the right time. So working with all the other disciplines is always important in healthcare, but in a situation like a mass casualty, we all have to work together more quickly, knowing people's names, knowing phone numbers, contact information. Starting off early in the morning, calling a couple of friends that work at the Miro Center to open up that as a family reunification center. And if we didn't have those bridges and relationships already, we wouldn't be able to walk across those bridges at a time like this. The trauma services team, the emergency department team, it's the frontline staff that really make this tick. They're the ones that make this go. They're the ones that have the expertise in the plan. So it's really, how do we make that expertise, their planning, how do we make that fit with our system and our preparedness? And how can we get that plan socialized and educated to everyone else? So it's really them that they do the heavy lifting on this. And I just try to make sure that we're on the right path. We still have our doors open to medical patients and strokes and heart attacks. So we have some of those patients coming in as well. We will not be in the way of actual patient care. So we will use hallways and corridors to stay away from the actual patient care that's taking place. You can never take a day off in a hospital. We'll always have patients. So it's how do we best serve them by preparing, but also by not impacting their stay with us. That's bringing extra staff. That's simulating certain things that might impact patient care. There's a lot of different things we do to make sure that we're respecting what's going on, still delivering excellent care to every patient we see, but also on top of that, preparing to, to do the same in a disaster. For a drill like this, we have a lot of things on paper. We have a lot of procedures and ways that we think we would do things, but when you're actually drilling and you have people here playing the part of those patients, thinking about the family that would be involved, um, all of a sudden those policies come to life and either they work really well or you start to realize, oh, there's gaps or there's pieces that we've understood but not understood fully and so this is something we need to think about more. It's uh, very helpful to see what it actually be like, at least somewhat in real life. We want to learn, first of all, make sure everyone understands the plan, and then second of all, we want to see any gaps in the plan so we can adjust the plan and modify it and see where our weaknesses are and try and strengthen them up. We can't predict if something's going to happen, but we want to be ready if it does happen. So we need to extend that and plan for search and open new areas 
in, in order to take extra patients. It's identifying how do we sustain that and how do we look at the, the next steps moving forward. How do we improve on what we, we didn't like today? How do we add in things that make more sense? How do we communicate better? These are all things we're looking at. This is really the beginning in a lot of ways of the planning process to see what actually happened. The, the words came off paper today and it's really moving into the next phase to refine what we saw. An MI is a myocardial infarction which is also known as a heart attack which is how most people know it. The heart's like an engine and it's got three fuel lines. And what a heart attack is, is when suddenly one of those fuel lines shuts down. So what the artery gets blocked with is cholesterol plaque. When you lack blood supply to your heart muscle, which is what a heart attack is, there's a clock that started. And after about six hours, a great majority of permanent heart muscle has been, damage has been done. And after 12 hours, it's probably completed. So the quicker we open up that artery, the less permanent heart muscle damage is done. When the artery shuts down suddenly, there's a time where the heart doesn't have any blood supply and it's in jeopardy of going into a fatal arrhythmia. Paramedics are trained to treat that arrhythmia. So if you call 911 and have that arrhythmia while the paramedics are there, they can save your life. But if you try to drive yourself in and have that arrhythmia, you would die. So it's essential that you call 911. When they arrive at your house, they'll do an EKG. If that EKG is suspicious that you are having a heart attack, they will notify the emergency room. The emergency room will then activate a pathway that so will be prepared for you when you come to the emergency room. When we see the patient in the emergency room, the first thing we need to determine is obviously are you having a heart attack? And that's usually evident based on the symptoms and the EKG. Once we've determined you're having a heart attack, we're focused on getting that artery open as fast as we can a pathway will be initiated where we'll move quickly to go from the emergency room to the heart catheterization laboratory where we can open up the artery immediately. The quicker your artery is opened up, the less heart muscle damage it's done. What's good about the Parkview system is that there's a cardiologist available 24 hours a day, every day of the week, in the hospital, waiting for somebody to come in with a heart attack. There's a huge team approach that's required to coordinate the care from when somebody's having a heart attack in the field to getting their artery opened up. The more time you wait with an artery that's shut down, the more likely you are to either die or have permanent disability. So it's very important if you think you're having a heart attack not to stay at home, but to summon emergency care. Am I?